Ted, thanks for sitting down with me today. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Ted, you've talked before about uh, there being three key drivers in crop production, breeding, biotech, and agronomic information. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how Monsanto has brought that together for producers in the U.S.? Sure. It, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense for a seed company to be in all three. But traditionally, uh, seed companies, well, if you go back, seed companies were only breeding companies, mm -hmm. right? And then there were uh, separate biotech companies who were trying to develop genes. Monsanto was really the first one to try to put those two together in the way we did. And uh, that driver was biotech to breeding. Breeding was it was a non-traditional way to do it. Um, so <clears throat> uh, seed companies, breeding seed companies, historically had agronomy groups, right? And, and some of our most famous competitors had really good agronomy groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of went by the wayside a little bit in the breeding biotech era. Uh, it's a little mystifying why that happened. Um, we're going at agronomy in a non-traditional way, just like we merged the other two. And if you think about it, it makes loads of sense because everything, our, our whole focus is the seed. I actually use a slide in the PowerPoint presentations where there's a seed between the thumb and the forefinger. That's our whole focus. And the reason it's our whole focus is because we build um, yield into that seed via breeding. We try to protect that yield with biotech traits, and then we had like we try to add to it with breeding and biotech traits. But we're really not getting as much out of that germplasm value or yield potential as we could. And the natural extension of that is to try to hook together an agronomic system that ma that maximizes the yield potential in that seed. If you think about it, you take a standard. Midwestern cornfield, um, you start out with, let's just say, 300 bushel yield potential, or 250, or some number. Yeah. It depends on the field. And then all you're trying to do is to not lose it <laughs> throughout the growing season, right? You're trying not to screw it up. And everything that happens almost always decreases the yield to the actual measured yield at the end of the season. And by putting together the combination of breeding and biotech and agronomic systems that we're working on, we're trying to actually realize more of that original yield potential that existed in that field. And that's really our basic strategic approach. Ted, prior to becoming integrated farming system lead for Monsanto, you were head of uh, plant breeding. Right. Can you talk to us a little bit about, um, well, obviously that was an exciting move for you, why the move from plant breeding into IFS? Well, there are two, two real reasons. Uh, maybe three, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a personal philosophy that a dozen years in one job is probably long enough. Right. Right? <laughs> and I'm the only guy you're going to meet in Monsanto that had the same job and the same boss for 12 years. Right. Okay? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, absolutely. and I still have the same boss. Right. Um, but. Um, when you, when you looked at what we did in the plant breeding group, we basically had a global germplasm integration strategy, and specifically for corn. And when we made all the acquisitions, we essentially bought 36 germplasm bases around the world. And when we put them together, we ended up with a lot of uh, really interesting genotypic responses to plant density, fertilizer rates, etc. And so for quite a while in breeding, we've been looking at hybrids, um, for example, that were, had a real fixed ear and needed a higher density to, to display their yield potential, higher than farmers normally planted. So one of the questions was, what are we going to do with these things? If you put them out in an ordinary system, they're going to look average. If you put them out in the system where they can shine, they're significantly better. So when we looked at that, it, it just all of a sudden started to make total sense that we needed to develop what now is Integrated Farming Systems, or IFS, to actually realize the, the true potential of our germplasm pipeline. And, and when we talked about that internally, it made a lot of sense to just build on the 12 years of breeding and start our IFS group.
And so that was the opportunity. So it was personally, you know, time to turn it over to somebody with new fresh ideas. Right. Second thing was this is another chance of a lifetime to truly make a difference. Um, and the third thing was that I, I, ha I farm. Some people play golf for a hobby, and I farm for a hobby, about a thousand acres, and so I was experimenting with these integrated farming concepts on my own farm, and so I truly knew that we could make this thing work. Can you tell us a little bit about field scripts, how, how, what it is, and why is it important to the seed industry, and, and maybe most importantly, what does it mean to producers? Sure. Our, in Monsanto, we're really product focused. Um, we, our job is to turn an idea into a product. It, it's not just science for science sake. And so in the case of field scripts, we needed to turn the idea of variable rate seeding, which is not new, everybody's been experimenting with it, farmers, retailers, seed companies, etc. We needed to turn it the idea of a variable rate seeding prescription across a field, across different management zones, we needed to turn that not only into an algorithm, we turn it, needed to turn it into an electronic message which became a product which you could wirelessly transfer from a computer through the cloud to a controller on a tractor and a planter and actually uh, control the planter so it executed the script. That's what we've done. Right. And, and it's a very slick system. The farmer acceptance of this is, is off the charts, like 96% approval wow. for uh, basically an experimental approach for iPad and FieldView Plus. So that's what we've been working on. Why that's so important is that this kind of a system allows you to prescriptively apply almost anything. And, and one of the limitations has been thumb drives. The first thing I told our team when I got them all together was, we are going to outlaw thumb drives. There will never be thumb drive use in integrated farming systems. It's got to be wireless. And we've got to make it iPad simple. Farmers have big thumbs and big fingers, you know. The, an app is about the size of a farmer's finger. That's about perfect. Right? If it gets any more complicated than that, we're, it just isn't going to work. And so we turned them into um, uh, electronic uh, prescriptions that are transferred wirelessly, that are really simple. And when you think about um, the broader application, it, ma it makes total sense that the seed industry ought to really take a look at it. Tim, what would you say is one thing that Monsanto has had success with in the last 12 months that maybe folks don't know about? And then what do you see in the next 12 months? Yeah, well, um, some of the answers to that are, are I can't tell you. <laughs> Fair, enough. Right? Fair enough. But you will know about it in another 12 months. Um, I think I'd point to the iPad field view um, system that, that our team has developed. And um, it, actually, it's the precision planning team that developed it. Because that allows us to layer all the yield maps that a farmer has without a lot of effort um, and show it in HD, control planters and yield monitors on combines, and, and have a, a real continuous, real-time feedback loop on either how the planter's performing or what is the true yield um, on the going through the combine. That system, I think, is, um, is going to set a new industry standard. I know I'm biased about it, but, but when we put this out with our groundbreaker farmers this year, several hundred of them, the, uh, the acceptance and, and approval of the, when we surveyed them what, is just off the charts. It's almost 100% love it. Wow. Good spot it, to be. It, it's, it's unreal. I mean, this is a really good system, and it's so easy to use, and I think that's probably our biggest thing. Is we've done a bunch of other things, too. I mean, we've proved the value of a, of a variable rate seeding prescription, too. Um, so. Ted, uh, earlier this year you received the uh, Iowa Innovation Founder Award from Iowa Innovation Corp. 
Congrats, by the way, on that. Um, they talked about your 10 years of, of efforts towards, um, and I'm going to quote the language, um, have led the effort to change how economic success is measured, how to define gaps in innovation ecosystems, and how these gaps can be filled. Can you tell us a little bit about how the changing these parameters is important to you personally, and, and then also to the industry? Yeah, I'll, I'll spare you my why I love Iowa speech. Okay, <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> but three governors have bought it, right. and <laughs> two of them were Democrats, and the current one's a Republican. So it's a bipartisan <laughs> message, and and that's actually the the way the the group of us that started what's now known as the Iowa Innovation Council uh, more than ten years ago. When we set it up, we said this is not a red issue or a blue issue. This is a this is about Iowa. And so we kind of set it up with that philosophy that it truly had to be nonpartisan, and it was about everybody in Iowa pitching in. The thing we noticed was that there had, if you looked at how Iowa had grown historically, going way back to when John Deere himself came across the river and set up, right, yeah. or the Maytag company, or we can go down the list of a lot, uh, Vermeer, or you know, just name it, Pella Windows, etc. The, whether they were in ag or not, um, the, the real uh, theme was innovation. People came to Iowa and invented stuff. And so when we set up this whole effort, it was about getting the entrepreneur uh, help so that the entrepreneur could become another John Deere. And it's that journey where just because you have a great idea doesn't mean you're going to get there. And, but we looked at that journey map and said, we got a lot of people with really good ideas that never get to that point because they can't survive what we call the valley of death. Right. Okay? And they run out of money, they run out of their family's money, they don't have enough help to write a business plan, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole program that we put together to help um, Iowa inventors get their idea to the marketplace and get it tested. And then the other really um, almost brutal hurdle is the market will decide, okay? And so, but you have to get it in a position where you can get a, a market reaction. And our whole thing in innovation-based uh, economic development is to get the idea to the point at which the market or the venture capitalists or the investors can decide. That's been our focus and I think that's what may, has made Iowa's program um, successful and unique. Important stuff. It, it, we, we believe that. It, we're, you know, it's like, I, I've served as the chief technology officer for three governors. And I always say, well, you know, they can cut my salary in half if they want. Right. <laughs> because right. this is all volunteer work on everybody's part, and we've managed to get um, a, a lot of really important people across the state involved in it. That's great. Ted, thanks again for sharing the story. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.